So I greet again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all, depending where you are. It's a pleasure to be here. I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Anik, the invitation. And uh, I have the pleasure to have brought my students to, to see this uh, conference as well. I hope uh, to speak less than one hour on this topic, and then we can have at least half an hour of uh, questions and comments. Um, first of all, uh, I greet you in beha on behalf of the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Florianópolis. Santa Catarina is an island in South Atlantic. Um, and the university it has 43,000 students, 15,000 from them are graduate students, is a university that produces around 600 PhD theses a year. And uh, we have the privilege in Brazil to be one of these 20 22 countries in the world that have free uh, higher education. Students don't have to pay any cent to be students on graduate or undergraduate students at our university. It's a public university. Our UNESCO chair, headquartered at this university, as Professor Anita already said, is a network of uh, 26 institutions, not only universities, institutes and academies in 16 countries. And these universities work in 11 different languages. So the chair is a lab to see how we can work together, not using only one language, but a multiplicity of possibilities uh, of this multilingualism. The research domains uh, uh, focus the, the internationalization of higher education, intercultural mediation, language education, uh, translation, economy and linguistic rights. Of course, the very important question of ICTs and migrations, borders, and diasporas. Um, to begin with, some, uh, some few words on Brazil. Brazil is the fifth biggest uh, country in the world after Russia, China, Canada, and the US, and the fifth in population with uh, 213 million uh, inhabitants. It's a federal country in three levels, so federal government, state governments, and municipal municipality governments. Brazil has 26 states and 5,800 municipalities. I tell that because this is an important aspect for language management in regions and in, uh, in uh, localities where different languages can be spoken. Uh, what means to observe language policies in a region like a country, for example? We have some approaches to do that. One of them that you all uh, know is the proposal from Spol uh, by Spolsky uh, that divides the field in language beliefs or ideologies that organize the um, opinions and, uh, and possibilities for different aspects of language policy. Language ideologies is a very well-known uh, concept. Second one is language practices in that we can observe how the society itself organize these uh, interrelations between language communities, languages, and practices from very different points of view. Here we can observe these uh, language policies bottom up uh, in many cases. And in the opposite side, we have this language management uh, perspective where we can see how laws and how the implementation of laws, executive orders of different instances of government try to administrate the multiplicity of languages and languages com language communities in a territory. But a second proposal, we could see the ideas from uh, Richard Ruiz as a tool, as a methodology to observe language policies and language planning, we could see how languages are considered a problem in a country. For example, when a country, a state, try to suppress some languages, we, we could observe on, on the opposite direction how different communities fight for their right, for the right to have their languages represented in the identities of the state 
in the cultural uh, apparatuses of the state, like schools, like uh, uh, art, um, in the arts domain, and so on. And we can see how countries use languages as a resource, how groups in this country observe that languages can bring us something that can open doors and be opportunities for governance, for geopolitical advantage, for economy, and so on. So my exposition will bring these three proposals together. So uh, I, I, I would say um, I will uh, propose uh, three points in my exposition. The first one is the um, uh, construction of uh, monolingualism and multilingualism as a, a politique de longue durée, uh, a, a, a long-term policy in the Brazilian history with many consequences. The second one is uh, how the constitution of 1988 make, made possible uh, some shy movements in the direction of multilingualism. Then we are going to observe uh, how geopolitical constraints organize the field of language policies in Brazil. And in the last moment, how Portuguese is seen as an asset uh, for international relations and promoted by the state abroad. Uh, in this history, we have moments in that uh, the national state, the national language, in the monolingual state was the most important objective of the government. Then a second moment in that multilingualism began to make sense and began to organize language policies. And the last one in that we try to see how, for example, the field of foreign languages, how the internationalization of higher education, how migrations, how internet and the digital revolu the revolution of languages brought other points of view for the management of, uh, of languages. But what, uh, what is to observe a country? We cannot see a country without interpreters, interpretation of what the history of that country is. And interpreters, of course, of course in interpret the country in very different ways. Brazil has a very rich history of social thinking, social critical thinking, uh, that try to understand what Brazil is. We could maybe divide this group of interpreters, of social thinkers, in three groups, liberals, organic, and criticals. Um, the first group, liberals, try to explain Brazil through some lack. What is lacking in Brazil? What should Brazil have that Brazil does not have and should have? For example, Raimundo Faoro in the Honors of Power try to inter interpret Brazil uh, as a country in that uh, uh, developed bourgeoisie is lacking. So the economic reality is very dependent on the state. That's an interpretation for, for understanding what Brazil is. In the second group, the most famous name is Gilberto Freire that wrote Casa Grande e Senzala, the most uh, important study on the race relations and uh, slavery uh, in Brazil that changed the perspective of the Brazilian society. Gilberto Freire tries to, ex tries to explain uh, what Brazil is through specificities of a Brazilian civilization that is connected mainly with race relations, tolerance, capacity for, um, for living together, uh, and building the image of Brazil as an example to be followed by other countries, uh, a place where the question of racism was in many aspects uh, resolved. That is a book of the 30s. Uh, and the last uh, perspective that describe conflicts in the Brazilian society, mainly economic uh, conflicts, has Florestan Fernandes from the University of Sao Paulo as a very important name in his book, The Integration of Blacks in the Class Society, that try to explain how slavery 
is the most important mark for understanding the Brazilian society, a society that was created through the institution of slavery in the comprehension from Max Weber as institution. Institutions create societies. Uh, so he has a Marxist, Marxistic uh, point of view to explain the Brazilian society. What all of these scholars don't touch, what we are not going to find in the Brazilian critical thinking are considerations on multilingualism and languages. Multilingualism has no place in this discussion about Brazil. So multilingualism is not visible and the problematic of languages and language communities uh, in the proposition of a, a culturally pluralistic society is not present. That's the constatation of Simon Schwarzman, very important uh, sociolo sociologist from Rio de Janeiro. And so we could say that we have uh, high intensity language policies associated to building monolingualism in the Brazilian history and low intensity language policies in the construction of multilingualism. Both uh, dimensions of our history have very unequal representation and very unequal result in this product that is the Brazilian, uh, the Brazilian society. So what is the result? Today, also Brazil is the 90th or the 10th most multilingual country in the world with more than 315 spoken languages. 90 8,5% of Brazilians are monolingual in Portuguese and live not far from the coast. You can see this population map. You can see that uh, the most important population uh, is on the coast. Although, for example, indigenous languages are mostly represented in the Amazonas region or in many other regions, but in far from the coast. Uh, how is possible that a country like Brazil, where more than 1,000 languages were spoken in 1500, when Portuguese arrived in our coasts, uh, has today this uh, characteristic of monolingualism? It can be seen, of course, that if we have only 1,5% uh, of uh, bilingual or multilingual Brazilians, the representation of this population in elections as voters is very low. And so multilingualism is not a proposal of any political party. It's not represented as a, a demand in the most uh, important political questions of the, of the country, in elections, for example. Uh, less than 2 million, 2.5 million of the uh, uh, 213, sorry, 213 million Brazilians uh, speak other languages uh, that can be migration languages that are in Brazil for many generations. In three years, for example, we are commemorating 200 years of German in Brazil. The first German uh, immigrants arrived 1824 and German was ininterruptly spoken till today in many different configurations or indigenous languages, or African languages that were, were brought together with the slaves, or sign languages, or Creoles that developed in neighboring uh, borders to Brazil, like the French Creole on the French Guiana that is spoken by indigenous population in Brazil as well. And uh, border languages that are new languages that can be created on this context of bilingualism or multilingualism. So the ideology of Brazil as a monolingual space, the identification from Brazilians as speakers of Portuguese is the leading uh, element of the Brazilian identity and the language policies that were developed in the country. But the, the field is more, is more plural. By auto declaration in the censuses, census uh, of 2010, the around 1 million of indigenous people that live in Brazil today 
declared that they spoke in 274 different languages. And the census detected that only 37% of the indigenous uh, people speak an indigenous language. Then we have uh, 50, 56 immigration languages. Uh, some of them present in Brazil, three, four, five, even six generations. One official sign language, but many other uh, um, uh, lang sign languages in emergence, mainly indigenous sign languages. In Afro-Brazilian languages that survived from uh, the very brutal uh, violence of uh, slavery and are spoken by small groups in uh, coastal regions from Brazil. Very important to say that uh, also uh, this number of uh, languages, Brazil has a very big linguistic diversity with uh, around 39 different uh, language families what brings a history of uh, very complex migrations. If you take a continent like uh, uh, Africa, uh, there are much less families in Africa or in India. Uh, India has many languages, but uh, not many language families are represented. Here we have almost 40 different language families. It's one of the most plural uh, spaces in language families. So we can say that the new republic, this is space from the constitution from 1988 till today, is a space where shy uh, attempts of building monolingualism were, were tried. I will, uh, before of that, uh, mention the repression policy that brought to this uh, monolingualism. Uh, we can see a rich history of uh, laws to repress languages. No Latin America country has a so complex uh, system of laws to suppress languages, to forbid languages, to devaluate languages, to punish uh, speakers because they speak uh, some specific languages. In the colonial time, uh, it began in the 17th century, but the most uh, famous document is the Diretorio dos Indios from Marquis de Pombal that uh, had as objective to repress the general language of the Amazonas region, Nyengatu. It was a very um, common language in Amazonas. And so this, um, this law was made to repress uh, these and other languages and to put Portuguese as the only possibility for this colonial space. Uh, I like very much these, uh, these uh, considerations from uh, Jose Rodriguez that uh, bring us the idea of a permanent war of languages, that a permanent violence against populations of different uh, uh, origins in Brazil, and that uh, it causes unprecedented efforts, uh, unprecedented uh, suffering, suicides, deaths, and so on the implementation of this uh, monolingual uh, Brazil. The Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese history uh, is very connected with slavery. The Japanese slavery in the 16th century that few people outside our space uh, know that were forbidden by King Sebastião in uh, 1578. Then for us, the most important, the one of the most important kinds of slavery, the indigenous slavery, and the African slavery for Brazil, these both slaveries are central. And in the 19th century, Portuguese were acting from Macau in the Chinese slavery, bringing Chinese slaves to the United States to build uh, railways, for example, uh, what was forbidden only in the end of 19th century uh, by uh, the Portuguese government. Why the African uh, slavery is the most important uh, demographically. Um, a famous Brazilian economist uh, explained it very easily. Uh, it's very easy to understand uh, through capitalist reasons, the African slaves were the cheapest. The, the indigenous slavery 
created a kind of profession that we call in Brazil bandeirantes that went to the hinterland to make war with indigenous people, to capture, to bring them to the coast, to sell them in the moment in that there was some impediment to bring slaves from Africa. It had many implications in migration of indigenous people inside Brazil. So languages uh, changed territories very often because of this persecution. Then uh, probably the most important fact in the Brazilian history that hundreds of African languages were brought together with uh, almost 5 million slaves in, three, in 400 years. Brazil was probably the most uh, uh, intense slavery experience in the history. Brazil has more slaves than the Roman Empire in 1,000 in one years. And that, uh, that fact shaped the Brazilian society in a very deep uh, uh, way. But today, most of these African languages uh, disappeared and we have very small communities that speak Afro-Brazilian languages like Gira da Tabatinga in Minas Gerais or the Falange uh, the, do Cafundó in Sorocaba, few dozens of uh, people that use these languages descending from African languages today. Some scholars try to find out in what way the African heritage uh, produced Brazilian Portuguese, how Brazilian Portuguese is a product of uh, the contact to indigenous languages and with uh, millions of speakers of African languages. And the field is quite uh, uh, divided in Brazil. So we can see a topic, a important topic of uh, ideology, conservatives, conservative linguists in Brazil try to say that uh, there was no influence that uh, what happened in Brazilian Portuguese is just the normal evolution of language, the normal change of language that every language come through. And the other group tried to explain that Brazil comes from a decreolization process, that Brazilian Portuguese, popular Brazilian Portuguese is the result of a history of creolization and then decreolization through migration to arrival from uh, millions of Portuguese, or 100,000 of Portuguese, uh, mainly in the first gold rush of the history that was in the 18th century in Minas Gerais. And the, a very uh, big uh, part of the Portuguese population migrated to Brazil to, uh, to run behind gold in this, gold in this moment. If you uh, go to the Republic, we can see the continuity of this repression policy and with many legislation, especially in the period between 1937, 1945, we have an open policy for forbidden languages, the institution of the idiomatic crime, language crime, linguistic crime were instituted. And, uh, that is connected with the first Brazilian dictatorship in the 20th century, the new state from Getulio Vargas. Uh, and in this moment, the mainly uh, goal of the repression were not the indigenous languages. It was the immigration languages, mainly languages from communities that were established in Brazil over 50, 80 years, but that have developed institutions like German, Italian, Japanese, Arabic, like uh, schools, journals. In Brazil, we had more than 80 newspapers circulating in German. There was a Brazilian literature in German that is not visible in the Brazilian faculties of letters, for example. We had uh, literary production in uh, Veneto, the most important variety of Italian spoken in Brazil that today has a proper name, Italian, the Brazilian, uh, the Brazilian koiné that uh, represents the Italo-Brazilian community, that is uh, the Italo-Brazilian community has 25 million persons. So in this moment, uh, the, the 
the, uh, uh, the objective was to repress these uh, immigration languages. And it uh, represented uh, closing schools, closing newspapers, uh, forbidding the public use of the languages, institu instituting uh, concentration camps for descendants of Germans or Italians that spoke the language, like in my university. My university is the only university in Brazil that in its territory was a concentration camp, the Trindade concentration camp. You can see here this book, uh, Memoirs of Another War, Memories of Another War, um, the, the war against uh, the German, Italian, and so on, the speakers in Santa Catarina State, where we are. Uh, Santa Catarina was the most multilingual state in Brazil in 1940. 25% uh, of the houses did not use Portuguese, but these immigration languages at uh, home language. Uh, one of them, one of the most important is Hunsrückisch. Hunsrückisch uh, is a German variety, a Western German variety from the region where in German is the Pfalz, Palatinado in Portuguese, on the border to France. Uh, this language variety maybe can, call, can be called in Germany Pfälzisch, but it became the koine of the German immigration in Brazil. And today, around 1 million Brazilians speak Hondurikish uh, as home language, a language that is not represented in writing, uh, by writing, almost not, almost not represented in uh, schools and so on, because uh, uh, linguistic right is uh, unequal in Brazil. For example, today, indigenous languages have some rights rights to school, for example, but immigration languages do not. So that's an interesting topic, how a state produce unequal legislation to different groups of languages that have different legitimacy in the national uh, space. Very short, three initiatives of this period after the constitution to reverse this construction of uh, monolingualism. First of all, a uh, strategy for co-officializing languages at uh, municipalities. Second one, the recognizement of languages as national heritage. And third one, promoting bilingualism on the country's borders to recognize borders as an opportunity and not as a problem. First of all, uh, Brazil has today uh, Brazil has today uh, 16 co-official languages in 41 counties or municipalities in different regions of uh, the country. I had the opportunity to work in the pilot project in the north of Brazil. And today that's a uh, social technology, you can say, that can use the structure of the municipalities to promote the language, to recognize them, to give some uh, rights to speakers and to recognize that uh, because of the sociolinguistic uh, structure of Brazil is very fragmented. So the language policy should be executed mainly in municipalities, not on states, on state or on federal base, because the languages are, uh, just have majority of speakers in very small regions and not in wide regions like states or even the union. Uh, the project uh, was born in São Gabriel da Cachoeira in 2002, a region with a predominance of uh, indigenous population, a region that is uh, bigger than Portugal, is a one Brazilian municipality, uh, where 24 different languages of five families are spoken on the border to Colombia and Venezuela. And there was created a pilot uh, project to officialize languages that is spread like a social movement to other municipalities in Brazil. So we could say that social technologies for language policy, if they reach reality, uh, sociolinguistic reality, they can spread and they can 
be in favor of bottom-up uh, policies and uh, favor uh, language communities, small language communities. For example, this policy of co-officialization make possible that the Federal University of Amazonas, the most important public university on the state of Amazonas, produced uh, a higher uh, education course for speakers of the three official languages of the municipality, Tucano, Baniwa, and Ingatu. And this uh, undergraduate course was responsible for the first uh, scientific researches in those languages, putting the languages in a new domain, open the gate for scientific production, production in indigenous languages, what is uh, very rich in terms of, uh, uh, of the universe of uh, cultural developments that these people produced in thousands of years living in Amazonas, for example. But they are absolutely not represented in the official research um, uh, policies of the Brazilian universities that are more connected to Anglo-Saxon spaces than to the cultural environment of our languages. Uh, the second policy in this moment is the, the national uh, policy for recognizing languages as heritage. That is not a bottom-up uh, policy in one aspect, it's more a, a top-down policy in the, in the sense that is produced by the federal government, but with much participation of communities uh, because it was very original in the beginning, in the beginning of this century, and is connected to the new policy of UNESCO to recognize immaterial heritage. You know that before 2000, uh, the policy of heritage was connected to material uh, uh, things like churches or buildings or, and the new policy make possible to consider that heritage can be uh, immaterial uh, 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 things like music, like ideas, like uh, drawings, or even languages. That was the idea, and Brazil was pioneer in developing uh, a methodology to do that. Uh, our methodology was uh, ready some few years before the methodology uh, proposed by UNESCO uh, in the new Atlas of World Languages to detect and to, uh, and to describe uh, this aspect uh, of language in community. Um, that's a very new policy that was created in 2010 and that uh, uh, today recognized only nine languages till the moment. Uh, this strategy mobilized communities. Communities must uh, demand that the state recognize the language. It organized normally uh, management uh, groups or management uh, instances to, uh, to be the representatives of this language community as a as the uh, federal government. And the first uh, recognized language was Guarani, a language that Brazil share with Bolivia, Paraguay, Argentina. And in, in, in that variety of Guarani is spoken in around uh, 80 villages in a space of uh, 800,000 square kilometers in South Brazil. Mm -hmm. The third aspect, the third question is how to consider borders not as a problem, like in many regions of the world where borders have uh, walls and where the army is on the border and so on. The Brazilian borders are not closed. The borders from Brazil to the neighbor countries. Brazil is the country with the third biggest number of neighbors in the world after Russia and China. We have 13 neighbors. Also, most of them speak uh, Spanish. And that makes the border between Portuguese and Spanish the longest border between two languages in the world. So how could we use this, uh, this resource, this possibility? How could we evaluate, evaluate positively this border? 
So uh, Argentina made a proposition that Brazil accepts, accepted in 2005. And uh, the good results of this project make the a project for uh, a bilingualism, Portuguese and Spanish, to be considered an asset and to be incorporated by uh, the language policies of Mercosul. Mercosul is the Southern Common Market, Mercado Comum del Sur in Spanish. It's an economic union between Uruguay, Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil. Venezuela joined, but uh, in this moment, the country is suspended. And uh, the project uh, of uh, bilingual border schools became one of the projects of Mercosul, spreading from the border Brazil-Argentina to the borders from Brazil to Uruguay, Paraguay, and Venezuela. Uh, it was connected to a sociolinguistic idea. We have in the country 26 twin towns Twin towns are cities that are in their territory in more than one country, border cities. Maybe they are divided by a river and a bridge. Sometimes they are just divided by a street and you can cross to their both sides without any, any complications. Yeah? Uh, Brazilians and neighbors don't need passports to travel from one country to the other. We can use normal IDs. There are no visas. So uh, traffic between uh, the countries uh, uh, is quite uh, open and quite free. And there are some agreements that make possible for Brazilians to live in Argentina and Argentina and Brazil and so on without uh, uh, much complication. The idea was creating a system of border schools using public schools that already existed uh, so that one Brazilian school and one Argentinian school on the border could be considered just one. And teachers from the Brazilian side could go to the Argentinian side twi twice or three times a week and teach in Portuguese to Argentinian children. And the opposite, Argentinian teachers come to the Brazilian side because it's quite a few, few kilometers far and teach in Spanish. And our children will become bilingual and could understand, read, speak, and uh, understand, understand uh, Spanish and Portuguese after eight years of uh, schooling. That project exists from 2005 till 2017. In 2017, this project was suppressed because Brazil, after a government change, came back to an English-only strategy. and. Uh, the integration to the neighbors and the use of this bilingualism uh, between two languages was, uh, was not possible anymore. What we can see from this first time, first part, that uh, the promotion of multilingualism uh, happens through bottom-up projects, through mobilization of agency of language communities, using more regional resources that not depend from the central government that pays less attention to multilingualism, um, using resources that already exist, They're not new resources, but the redirection of these resources to projects like uh, those, and making possible connection between internal and foreign policy, uh, sometimes using the uh, international leg legislation to pressure the Brazilian government to act uh, in the direction of uh, multilingual. So that was the first time, the first part, sorry, uh, the first part, promotion of multilingualism and of uh, monolingualism. I will, I will in 15 minutes uh, bring the two other topics, uh, going to this very important uh, topic of foreign language. Um, I will not, uh, of course, come into the history of foreign languages in Brazil, but just say that we have a central geopolitical question in the field of language policy in Brazil. And this central question is English only on one side and English plus Spanish on the other side. Yeah. These three languages build what I would say I would call a Brazilian repertoire of foreign languages. 
the number of people that master a foreign language in Brazil is very low. The British Council that made an evaluation uh, referred that exists uh, around 10 million Brazilians that can express in English. That's about 5% of the Brazilians. So if you go to Brazil, you are going to have an excellent opportunity to practice your Portuguese. Yeah. Or if you speak Spanish, you come through using uh, one general approach or strategy, Portunhol. That's this contact language between Brazil, uh, uh, Portuguese and Spanish that can be a historical variety in certain borders like in Uruguay or Misiones to Argentina, but can be as well a strategy for communicating between Portuguese and Spanish speakers. So uh, when the mili military dictatorship, the second one from 1964 to 1985 ended in 1985, Brazil promulgated a new law on education that uh, brought the guarantee that uh, municipalities, states could choose the foreign language they want to learn. And this uh, possibility brought some experiments with German, with French, with Italian. Uh, the field is in Brazil is very, very Western. Yeah, Brazil uh, in the field of foreign language it has very uh, much less experience with Asian languages, no experience with, uh, or very few experience with African languages. It's a very Western field. Uh, but these experiments from French, German, Italian, even Japanese are very restrict, very concentrated in some uh, small re regions. The big question was that in 2005, President Lula promulgated a law that uh, made uh, uh, mandatory that schools offer Spanish. And that law brought many action in producing uh, in producing capacity to teach Spanish in Brazil, um, focusing on this asset, Portuguese Brazilian, Portuguese Spanish intercomprehension, the so called Pan Iberic intercomprehension community, and the fact that uh, 21 countries have Spanish as an official language, and maybe more than uh, 40 million people in the United States speak Spanish as well, and the number is increasing. And the fact that uh, nine countries have uh, Portuguese as official language, and uh, Portuguese is one of the languages of China, because Macau, the region, the autonomous region of Macau has Portuguese as official language till 2049. And in fact, has one of the few universities in Asia that work in Portuguese uh, um, with other languages. And it's an important point for Portuguese in, in Asia. But what happened with the government change in 2016? The law for Spanish was suppressed and the government came back to English only policy. That's a uh, 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 a trend in Brazil. When conservatives, pro-American governments come to the power, English only policy follows. And the promotion of private schools with bilingualism, uh, English Portuguese for people that can pay for this bilingualism. When progressist governments come uh, to the power, a positive approach to uh, regional integration, to Latin American integration, and to a more plural policy in language policies in uh, foreign languages come to reality. So we can see these uh, trends in different moments of the Brazilian history. Uh, the, uh, uh, the connection between Portuguese and Spanish is a very important uh, geopolitical asset in this moment, the Organization of Ibero-American States is promoting actively both languages. And we are going to have an important conference in February on Portuguese and Spanish as scientific languages in the Ministry of Foreign Relations in Brazil, in Brasilia, to discuss this partnership between two languages with a, 
a, a high degree of intercomprehension to open for internationalization of higher education, for example. When Spanish was suppressed, uh, 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 popular mov movement, uh, a bottom-up movement came to reality, the so-called Fica Espanol, stay Spanish movement, that uh, talked to deputies and senators and so on, and made reality the officialization of Spanish as foreign language in many states and many municipalities, despite the fact that the federal government has eliminated Spanish from schools. So there was a very interesting uh, topic, uh, maybe one of the first uh, or the first uh, opportunity in Brazil in that uh, uh, a society movement claims uh, for a foreign language. And uh, in, in previous uh, moments, historical moments, uh, that was not the case. And the last topic to come to the end. So here in foreign languages, you can see the geopolitical pressure that all countries suffer. Brazil is not an exception. Brazil and Latin America suffer constantly this geopolitical pressure of the United States. And we can define many, much of uh, the, our language policies uh, in the continuum between moments in that the presence of the United States in the, on the continent is stronger or weaker. And different opportunities are open in these uh, uh, both uh, sides of the continuum. But Portuguese is the language of Brazil as well. Portuguese is so important for the Brazilian identity. Uh, Portuguese became official language in Brazil with the constitution of 1946, which should be the use of Portuguese for Brazil abroad. Uh, should we in, uh, understand like many ex-colonial countries that the language be, uh, belong only to the X metropolis that only Portugal should be uh, represented or should uh, spread the language abroad or should Brazil have an active policy in this sense. Yeah? Um, we have a very interesting book on this topic organized by our colleague uh, uh, Luis Moita Lopes, first in Portuguese, o Português no Século XXI, and then published uh, in in English with a different uh, title, Global Portuguese Linguistic Ideologies in Late Modernity, that discuss this uh, complex uh, situation of Portuguese in four continents. Uh, I recommend you the, the reading of this, uh, this volume uh, to understand that Portuguese is a bicentric language with two standards, an European standard and a Brazilian standard, 20 more uh, we have 20 more times Brazilians than Portuguese as speakers of the language. But European Portuguese is still a um, reference for the six African countries that have Portuguese as official for East Timor in Asia and for Macau. And there is a tension in uh, these uh, standardization policies between Brazil in Portugal, countries that uh, crossed the 20th century with divergent language policies for Portuguese, producing closed uh, tools. There is a Brazilian grammar, a Portuguese grammar, a Brazilian dictionary, a Portuguese dictionary, a Brazilian uh, certificate of proficiency, a Portuguese one, and both do not recognize the other as legitimate. But in the beginning of the, in the end of the, 20, uh, of the 20th century, after the fall of the Berlin uh, Wall, um, this policy began to be, to be transformed. We had uh, two different uh, orthographies till 1990, and then there was an important and formal agreement for unifying the orthography of Portuguese with many repercussions in the society, many groups against, many groups uh, uh, happy with this change, uh, and to try uh, trying to uh, eliminate this uh, comprehension from, from race in 2009, 
that the 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 presence of Portuguese in transnational space is almost in the limit of fragmentation in two languages. They are almost becoming two different languages. And of course, there are separatist movements uh, to consider, for example, that we speak Brazilian and not Portuguese. Right? But they are minority movements in terms of ideologies, not the strongest ideology um, in the country. It's very important to consider the possibility for language policies to read and to make prospects in demography. And I, I was very happy to make a study using data of the uh, Office of Population of the United Nations that uh, have uh, relative uh, conservative data. You can find other uh, data uh, less conservative in the sense of uh, projections that uh, are more um, uh, that favor higher numbers than this one that we used. But in this, with these numbers of the United Nations, we, uh, we have around 267 million speakers of Portuguese. This number is not uh, full realistic because uh, they are considering population of the countries. And we know that many countries like Guinea-Bissau or Mozambique have important parts of the population that do not speak Portuguese, although the number of speakers of Portuguese is increasing. And we can use the projection for 2100 to see that Portuguese will have more than 400 million speakers. But we can read here that today uh, the Brazilians are 76% of the speakers, whereas Portugal are only around 4%. But in the future, Brazil will be only a, around 46%. In Portugal, le, Portugal, less than 2% of the speakers of Portuguese. Where will be the others? They will be in Africa. And they will be mainly in Southern Africa, in Angola and Mozambique, that in this moment are crossing a moment of a very strong increase of population, like Brazil crossed in the 40s, 50s and 60s in the 20th century, with an average of uh, kids for each woman superior to five. And so the, the idea for the future is that uh, this language uh, that uh, was born in, in a corner of the Iberian Peninsula in the north of the Iberian Peninsula, where today is Galicia, became uh, most spoken in the Americas in the 20th century, in the beginning of the 21st century, but will be, will have as demographic center, the African continent in some decades. And then we will, will have a relative uh, stable uh, disposition of the language, 200 million speakers in Brazil and 200 million speakers in Southern Africa, making from Portuguese the most spoken language of the Southern Hemisphere and uh, strongly spoken around the South Atlantic uh, Ocean. Uh, what will be the consequences for the Portuguese standard, uh, standard systems of these deep demographic and economic and geopolitical changes? Of uh, internet in Portuguese, Portuguese is the fifth most use the language on internet, and the growth of Portuguese as second language, as foreign language in many contexts. So uh, the language policies for spreading Portuguese abroad are making these questions and trying to, uh, to see how it will be when we are going to have this kind of infographic, not more a force uh, coalition between Brazil and Portugal, but a stronger one in the relation between Brazil, Angola, and Mozambique, where most of the uh, speakers um, will be or can be. Uh, for that reason, uh, after the fall of the Berlin uh, Wall, the Portuguese uh, countries joined to create the International Institute of Portuguese, Maybe Portuguese is the only language that has an international institute to manage the language. Also much activity is doing uh, still 
in, on the national level by Portugal and Brazil. And this institute is a negotiation uh, point to make uh, joint policies to plan for the future. Uh, each four years, uh, the director come from a different country. And here are established the multilateral language policies for Portuguese as an international language. The headquarters is neither in Portugal nor in Brazil. The headquarters is in Cape Verde, a very small country, but situated in the geographic middle of uh, Lusophonic countries on the coast of Africa, 500 kilometers from Dakar in Senegal, a country with nine different uh, islands. Uh, Lusophonie, as we say, the Lusophonic countries are organized uh, in an international organization, CPLP, Community of Portuguese Speaking Countries. Uh, with many observers, we have uh, here uh, nine members, nine full members, and today 16 observers, countries like Argentina, like India, like Turkey, like Namibia, that can have some advantage of belonging to this kind of geolinguistic organization. CPLP is a geolinguistic organization like uh, uh, La Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, or uh, it was the Latin Union, the Union Latin, or the Organisa Organisation de los Estados Iberoamericanos, and so on. Okay. Yeah? Uh, uh, organization that uses language to promote international relations and international governance. So, I have three minutes uh, delay uh, to come to the end. So what questions we brought here for our discussion? First, high intensity language policies for building, multi, uh, for building monolingualism. How should we study the construction of mo uh, monolingualism as uh, a political process? And low intensity language policies for building multilingualism as a minority language policy uh, till today. Second, how can we study uh, repression campaigns on the world? Open repression campaigns like that from Franco in Spain or from the apartheid regime in South Africa uh, before 1990 or Brazil as a case study and how to recuperate these spaces to multilingualism after suppression of authoritarian regimes. Third, the long durée of linguistic beliefs and ideologies, uh, the long term of linguistic beliefs and ideology, how can they be stable? How it, it is difficult to uh, create new ideologies uh, and uh, what are the strategies and methodologies that we could use to do that? Uh, how we can understand the geopolitical pressures in this field of foreign languages? And how we can do a counter work, for example, for promoting our language abroad, for being our language be present in internet, on the international sphere, and the use of uh, linguistic geo political organizations with that purpose. And uh, the, la uh, the last one, uh, how can we see borders as an opportunity? How can we see borders as a place for promoting languages, for uh, learning foreign languages, for having uh, a strong connection with multilingual uh, bases? So, that was my exposition to begin our discussion. 